Um, and welcome everybody. I'm Heather Topsick, the director of the library at Bard Graduate Center. And I'm so happy to see so many of you here. Um, one of the silver linings to doing this virtually is people can join us from all over the country and indeed um, even outside the country I see um, on the list. Um, so although we're meeting virtually, I would like to begin this um, event with a land acknowledgement. Bard Graduate Center respectfully acknowledges our presence in Lenape Aking, the ancestral homeland of the Lenai Lenape, and recognizes New York City as a past, present, and future crossroads for many indigenous people. In addition, we would like to acknowledge those whose ancestors did not arrive on these lands of their own free will, and whose tremendous cultural, economic, and technological contributions continue to provide the foundation for our lives. Before introducing today's speaker, I'm going to share a little background on the BGC Library's Artist and Residence Program. Now in its third year, this program was developed in partnership with the Department of Public Programs here and is part of a wider institutional effort to bring artists in conversation with our gallery exhibitions and other institutional initiatives. The specific objective of the Library Air program, as we call it, is to invite visual or performance artists whose work is grounded in research to use our collections as an incubator for new work. Artists are conduct research in subject areas relevant to their practice or to, or to address the library itself as a concept, an institution, or an organized collection of material and information, utilizing the library's reference staff as partners in this process. The resulting collaborations create a unique opportunity for artists and for librarians, while highlighting the distinctive aspects of our research library and expanding Bard Graduate Center's relevance to a new audience. At this moment, we are halfway through this year's residency, which will culminate in an exhibition, possibly physical, most certainly virtual in some aspects in May and June. Despite COVID restrictions this year, our artists, Jenny Tobias, who presented last week, and Harley Grieco, managed to make regular visits uh, to research in our library this fall. And these work in progress talks are an opportunity for them to share their process and where they are in their projects. With that, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Harley Nigretko is a Chinese American lens-based artist born and raised in State College, Pennsylvania. She earned a BFA from the Cooper Union School of Art in 2013, receiving the Vincent J. Mielkarek Jr. Memorial Prize and the Sarah Cooper Hewitt Fund Prize. Harley has participated in residencies at Trestle Art Space and the Vermont Studio Center, in addition to completing a fellowship at the Bronx Museum. She's received scholarships and grants to attend workshops at Urban Glass, the Oxford of Art, the Penland School of Crafts, and currently she is based in Brooklyn, New York. And of course, her latest residency is here at Bard Graduate Center. And I'd like to welcome you, Harley, and I will turn the floor over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I wanna thank everyone at BGC for having me and Jenny so far this year. Um, it's been a wild ride, <laughs> but uh, exciting nonetheless, so. Thank you for that introduction. Hi, I'm Harley Nigrico. Um, I am a Chinese American lens based artist. I engage with landscape photography and uh, archaeologic fragmentation and sculptural decay. <clears throat> My work uses uh, uh, perceptions between image and object surface. Uh, decoration plays a large part in how I imagine a landscape. Uh, I'm very interested in how archaeology and abstraction can function within artwork. And I'm very interested in the space of convergence between photographic documents and decorative objects. Uh, as a Chinese American, uh, I actually grew up with a lot of Chinese porcelain around me. Um, my grandparents had a laundromat and a gift shop actually that sold a lot of porcelain wares and things of this nature. And uh, these objects kind of hold a familiar, but also an abstract space for myself. And I've been exploring kind of these relationships in my work for the past year and a half or so. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation. So thank you all for being here. Okay.
So yes, my talk is called Imagining the Artifact Collaging Blue and White Chinese Pottery. And I'm going to show you two uh, old series that I uh, ha have worked on to kind of ground my practice. And I'm gonna talk about three points of research and then my current projects that I am actually using this research for. So here we go. This is from a series called Entoptic Notes. And this is actually a collection of floral and vegetal images that are printed on pieces of broken drywall. Um, these images are actually fused onto the drywall surface uh, with liquid light. And uh, I'm very interested in how uh, the decorative can function in psychological space, how photographs can change materially <laughs> by just looking at them. Um, the drywall is very broken. Um, it has all the edges ripped out of them too. Um, and this kind of grounds my practice in a photo object relationship and how uh, time and artifact can affect objects like these. Uh, these two images are from a series called Aberration Archive, which is an ongoing series of gelatin silver, uh, of silver gelatin contact prints. Uh, and these are printed from deaccessioned museum slides. Um, so their color was fading and warping and all this stuff. And I printed them in kind of this black and white shadow version of themselves. Um, I'm interested in, in looking through archives, looking at these images. These are specifically uh, King Dynasty bases and uh, just trying to figure out how I can kind of reimagine these objects. And I'm gonna be coming back to this idea of reimagination through a lot of my research. So moving on to my first point of research, it is actually not uh, ceramic or porcelain. It is actually uh, this one practice of Chinese painting called Bapo painting. Um, I was very excited to actually stumble across this at the library. Uh, I wasn't expecting to find this at all, but Bapo painting is basically a collection of um, calligraphy, poems, rubbings, and uh, the artist who made all these pieces actually replicated all the folds in these pieces of calligraphy and poems and kind of scattered them in this uh, disorderly composition. Um, they emphasize ancient objects as part of meditation on Chinese culture. There's this idea of looking back. And this idea of looking back and how to move forward is something that I'm very interested in um, and how to combine um, contemporary images, contemporary pieces. Uh, I found this to be a really fruitful lens for me to think about collage in my own work and uh, just to kind of keep this in mind. Uh, I just thought it was very cool and very interesting. <laughs> oh, and a, a lot of this is going on in the late King period and this practice is actually still going on today. So there's contemporary artists that are also working in this form. And going on to what is Chinese blue and white porcelain? <laughs> I thought this would be a good place to ground exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about blue and white porcelain. Uh, it's a subset of Chinese ceramics. It, uh, porcelain itself is a material that is made out of kale and clay and stone mixtures such as feldspar, mica, and quartz. Uh, this combination is very complicated and there's many recipes um, and it was held secret for a very long time. Uh, this is very exciting. Uh, there's also a transparent glaze. The actual blue part is cobalt oxide, um, which is uh, also very important. And this didn't get introduced to China until later periods in the Yuan period, also from Persia in the Middle East. So all this intermingling, also very exciting. Um, there are four categories of porcelain that are usually talked about in all these academic books that I've been looking at. There was imperial porcelain, domestic porcelain, export porcelain, and private and special porcelain. And the porcelain that I found myself focusing on was export porcelain. Um, I was very interested in seeing how a lot of this porcelain was being disseminated throughout the world. Um, it's a very, very large history. Um, I've, I've really just been educating myself on a lot of this, which has been very, very exciting. Um, and so I'm focusing on Chinese blue and white export 
porcelain. <laughs> and a fun fact down here, the actual porcelain name comes from uh, when Marco Polo was actually in China in the Yuan dynasty. Um, and he thought that the surface of porcelain was similar to the cowrie shell. And porcelana is the Italian word for cowrie shell. So that's just a little fun porcelain fact there. And I just wanted to show this timeline of Chinese ceramic production just to really see the full breadth of history here. Um, this timeline goes from the Neolithic period all the way up to the Qing period. Um, so I'm really talking about a really small drop in the bucket, albeit a very important one, but I just think it's important that everyone kind of sees the, the dates over here in the early or in the late 1200s uh, into the 20th century here from the Yan, Ming, and the Qing periods. And these are some examples of blue and white porcelain from the Yuan Dynasty period. Um, I thought it was important to show these because I've been looking at a lot of drawing studies from this uh, period in particular. Uh, during the Yuan Dynasty, there was a lot of trade and also in some dynasties before with the Middle East with a lot of um, uh, Persian traders and exports and things of that nature. And blue and white porcelain really started to develop into its own within this time period. Uh, there was a lot of trade being started. Portugal was a huge part in the beginning of the porcelain trade. Uh, Macau and Canton were huge ports of trade in this period as well. Um, and through the beginning of the Ming Dynasty. Um, these in particular are from a collection, uh, the Tokapki collection, which is a museum in Istanbul, Turkey. And there's over 10,000 pieces from the Yuan Dynasty, which is actually very remarkable um, and very special. And it's been really good resource for me to look at. Um, and let's see. I have examples from the Ming period as well. This is the Ming dynasty right after the Yuan. And there's a lot of design work going on. There's a lot of influences that keep going throughout the Ming period. Um, this book that I was specifically looking at that was highlighting the Tokapi Museum uh, had all these wonderful diagrams. And I've been doing a lot of drawing studies from here, uh, trying to take in a lot of these motifs it's been a really uh, fruitful, fruitful resource for me. Um, and also trying to think about these designs and their permutations and how they were working and evolving throughout this whole time period here. And uh, going back to the timeline, somewhere uh, near the beginning of the main period, um, uh, Chinoza reproduction was beginning and this uh, British architect and design theorist, Owen Jones, also publishes a book called The Grammar of Chinese Ornament uh, near the middle of the Qing period. And both of these events, I think, are very important and interesting to look at. Um, what is chinoserie? <laughs> um, Chinoiserie uh, started to develop at the same time that all of these motifs and designs that were going on in China. Um, the porcelain trade was very complicated with all these influences going back and forth between the East and the West. Um, a, a, a lot of European countries started to create their own version of a lot of Asian goods. Um, and this also includes other uh, countries as well, like Japan and Korea. Um, so porcelain chinoiserie is a subset of chinoiserie from a lot of uh, other uh, art forms as well. And I listed different countries of production that had a lot of the main uh, types of porcelain that was being produced. We have a lot of other names that you might recognize here on the left with types of porcelain chinoiserie. There is so much history on this. <laughs> it is exciting and overwhelming. Um, so it's been fun to kind of flip through a lot of this stuff and just really see how a lot of influence is being spread throughout the world at this time. Um, 
I bring this up because I think it's important to understand uh, this idea of imitation and what that kind of means going forward in the 20th century and then uh, design theory and everything like that. So we have Owen Jones here on the left who I mentioned before. And he was known for um, making these really wonderful uh, publications and these books of design, these hand colored um, drawings. Uh, he did one of the Alhambra in Spain of Islamic design. Uh, and he also did one of Chinese porcelains that is from this museum in England. It is the South Kensington Museum. Now it's the Victoria and Albert Museum. And he was alive and working during the King Dynasty. So during the height of all this Chinoiserie production again. And the dissemination of these books actually really helps also foster this production of Chinoiserie. Um, and his books are really beautiful. I got a, uh, the chance to scan a lot of these books at BGC, which was really fantastic. Um, and it got me thinking a lot about his images. And of course, it's hard to bring up Owen Jones without bringing up Edward Said on the right, who is the founder of post-colonialism, very famous, very important man. Um, he wrote Orientalism in 1980, and it's basically talking about uh, Western perceptions of Eastern art and the problematic things that arise from that. So in, in a critique of Owen Jones, actually, Edward Said said that uh, his book of the Alhambra, he was treating Islamic design as an imaginary geography. And while I agree with his imaginary geography assessment of that book, um, I am very curious how to kind of reclaim this power of the imaginary, especially looking back on cultural material that is important to myself as a visual artist, to be able to look back on uh, this material way and to kind of reconcile with um, Owen Jones and his books and the imitations and what I can do with that as an artist. So I'm gonna show you some of his plates that I scanned here from examples of Chinese ornament. And as you can see, a lot of these are actually not blue and white porcelains. Um, in the Ming and the Qing period, there was a lot of color that was being developed. Um, there was a lot of different taste making that a lot of people were um, catering to in China. And uh, it, it's interesting to me to see all these translations and it got me thinking, um, what if I took these designs and brought them back to blue? bring them back to this cobalt oxide color from a dynasty or two ago. And what's kind of interesting from this book, it, the plates don't have that much information on the actual objects. So sometimes it's hard for me to tell if these are actually export porcelains or chinoiserie objects. Um, I might have to do a little bit more research on that. Um, but this whole book and this act of flattening, um, I was like, well, I can scan uh, some of his drawings and watercolors and cut them up and flatten them myself <laughs> and combine them with my own kind of landscape photography here. So I've been experimenting with a bunch of cyanotypes, um, which is a alternative photography process where uh, this blue uh, chemical is coated onto paper and exposed to light. And all these individual pieces of image that you see here are actually um, hand cut uh, pieces of negative. So all of these are actually unique prints that I have made and arranged here. And working in this way kind of helps me to figure out um, just how abstraction can work in this process. I'm a very process oriented artist. Um, it's been very fruitful for me to kind of uh, gather a lot of these images and break them up and try to reassemble something new. <laughs> and again, kind of bring the image back to the object, which is also what I'm very invested in in my art practice. Um, I was also doing some experiments with drawing uh, from the earlier yarn drawings that I showed you guys and kind of collaging a lot of these motifs 
and doing some drawings on mylar as a negative. Um, I'm going to be incorporating some of this into my sculpture work as well. So I will also show you. Oh yes, this is uh, my. Uh, th this shows you the scan on the left from the Chinese ornament book, and then I have the digital negative version, also from some of my photography on the left and what it would look like turning it into a digital negative. And this is actually what the process looks like for having these pieces cut out, arranged on this photosensitive paper that will turn blue and exposed in sunshine. <laughs> and the second part of my uh, current projects that I'm working on, um, I'm sort of showing you the vein in which I'm working here. Uh, I've been making a lot of drawings on ceramic tiles and breaking them apart and putting them back together and also putting my own photography as well. Um, and I am planning on making a lot of these kind of broken apart and reassembled objects uh, go to go along with the cyanotypes for the show at BGC. Um, I'm gonna be exploring these drawings more uh, from the Yan Dynasty. Oh, and this is a in-process shot to kind of show you uh, what things look like together, apart. Uh, the way I've been putting everything together is actually through a stained glass technique. It's called the copper foil stained glass technique. Um, so as you can see, there's copper here and that gets soldered together. There's my little soldering station in my studio. <laughs> and uh, this is kind of where my sculptural work is heading right now. Um, and it's been really great to actually be able to lay out all of this research at BGC and be able to bring it all to my studio and be able to kind of play with it and have it around. So let's see, oh yes, and I included a resource if you were curious about any of the books that I was reading. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Heather and we can have a conversation. Great, thank you so much, Harley. Um, and I and thanks to our panelists who are here in the Zoom room popping in um, today. Um, yes, uh, now is the time for us to open the floor to questions. And I wanted to remind you, those of uh, you who are on the attendee side, to use the Q and A function for questions, chat for comments. And those of you who are joining us in the Zoom room, um, either use the raise hand function, or if that doesn't work, um, sometimes it doesn't, just type "I have a question" in the chat, and then I will call on you. Um, but I will uh, take the liberty of asking the first question. Um, those of you who have attended some of these. Uh, uh, other air talks by now know that I like to start with a question that's grounded in library research. Um, so Harley, you outlined really well um, sort of your route through um, the materials, starting with the Bapo uh, drawings and some of the Wan Dynasty blue and white porcelain and Owen Jones grammar of Chinese ornament as inspiration for this series. Um, and I'd like you to, to talk a little bit more about about your research process and whether or not as you how you kind of came to this material and if in the course of your research you found other pathways that you might want to explore or go back to. Um, go. Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually found a lot of these books. Um, a lot of them are in the, the reference room at BGC, so just from a lot of poking around, really. Um, I'm a very uh, tactile and hands-on kind of book reader, so um, it was really nice just to start the research process and then be able to let my mind drift and be able to find things that I find interesting, compile them together. Um, the book scanner is also great. I've been scanning a lot. Um, so it's been a really nice process of looking and gathering, and I'm going to keep doing that for the spring as well. So, um, yeah, it's been really fun and really great. Um, I have one question coming in here that said, Harley, please tell us about any other inspirations that keep you creating. Oh, so I actually love looking at catalogs of archaeology, 
um, and kind of like bad versions of like old photo catalogs of a lot of um, <laughs> institutional archives. Um, ph photographic failure is something I'm really interested in and the failure to record things um, and sometimes how that can be very fruitful um, and also show like kind of the power of abstraction in these ways. So having technological, um, how you say, uh, timelines <laughs> and looking back and forward on these things, I actually find very inspirational just even in photographic technology. Um, uh, yeah, I'm inspired by a lot of things, but uh, I think that one is the most relevant to the library. <laughs> I see um, Heath has a hand raised. Um, Heath has. Oh, and Samuel's here too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, a couple questions. Um, one of them has to do with the concept of um, the export ware. Mm -hmm. Like, what did that come into play? Like, did the tailor made for a certain area of Europe come into play? Because I know, like, there are pieces that are made for the French market and pieces that are made for the English market, and they're distinctively different in some cases. Does that raise a question? Because <clears throat> the Chinese were very surprisingly adaptable in the 1800s. Oh, yeah. Um, it was really interesting doing this research because um, the introduction of like perspective, um, I, I believe from a lot of Jesuit missionaries actually during the Ming period, um, influenced a lot of painting on ceramics, um, also influencing like what people are depicting. Uh, I do feel like there are some things lost in translation sometimes, but um, I also think that exchange and what is understood and not understood is interesting. Um, it's kind of funny. I, I was kind of working backwards through a lot of this porcelain history. Like I was starting with a lot of chinoserie and being like, well, where did this thing come from? So then I was, I was trying to inch my way backwards. Um, and there's so much, um, again, you can spend many, many years uh, following a lot of specific designs. Um, I myself am particularly very drawn to floral and landscape images, just because um, in a lot of my own photographic practices, just as like meditative, imagery and what it kind of means to surround ourselves with objects that depict these particular images is something that always um, resonates with me very well and how those patterns evolve. Um, very interesting to keep looking and thinking and collaging <laughs> in my practice. It's a really loaded question to ask, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot, how Europeans in their copies or like takes on them, how they depicted Chinese people and how the Chinese people then depicted Europeans. There's like a weird, um, I mean, it's very loaded to talk about because it's, you know, stereotypes on both directions. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a, like a lot of, and I have no take on it yet, <laughs> but I'm <laughs> curious, like, it's a weird thing to talk about, but they were both doing it in some, both cases. And I think it's like an, a weird, like do you yeah no totally um it's uh i i am also interested in the scholarship actually to see what a lot of other people think about this um what i have found like common at least from what i've been reading is that like i mean money is kind of like the big <laughs> churner of a lot of this stuff and like the expectations of what uh like one porcelain company thinks will be the most lucrative um, like, <laughs> um, if all else fails, it's always good to follow the money. <laughs> um, and also just like what people think, uh, is, uh, foreign too, because, um, a lot of the Ming period actually, like, there's a lot of piracy going on and, uh, like there were so many people, like the Dutch were stealing from the Portuguese ships. Um, and it was making this like need and this want for this stuff that they couldn't export themselves. So like all this stealing and stuff, I, I, was, I was telling Heather before, it almost feels like a whole HBO show could be made on like export porcelain piracy. Um, <laughs> just because it's so crazy and um, 
uh, having all these like niches and stuff like this, uh, I don't know, it, it creates very bizarre desires and depictions of what people believe is foreign or valuable. So um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking through a lot of these themes and what it means design-wise, money-wise, commerce-wise, all this stuff, so. That's very helpful, actually, so I'm glad I asked about it. Um, and I'll just briefly say that I loved when you said um, the decorative motifs have a psychological place in space, and I, I just agree with that completely, and I loved the way you articulated it. Um, and I'll get on to my next question really fast. Um, did you consider 19th century repairs like stapling um, and bracketing when you were building your tile sculptures? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was actually thinking a lot about Kintsukiji too, which is the Japanese ceramic repairs. Um, that's actually on my list of things to research a little bit more also at BGC. Um, because this idea of having the repairs be a part of a new object is something I'm really interested in. And also like, uh, again, what it means to reassemble fragments. And also if, if it is new, if it is old, um, again, as like sculptural objects, um, I think a lot of people are really interested in archeological things these days actually. So yeah. it's very fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Heath. Those were great questions. And I see some questions coming into the Q&A and some raised hands. And I think I'll toggle back and forth and go over the Q&A. And the first question is coming in from Sadia Rayman. Um, beautiful work and presentation. Hard. Thank you. And what space does the crack and brokenness play in your practice um, regarding your sculptures, drywall, or even your sun prints? Yeah, um, process plays a huge role in, um, in craft and technique because I love learning new craft techniques. Um, it's, it, it's, it's something I try to pursue in my own practice a lot. Um, I'm, I, I'm a photography technician actually for my line of work. So I feel like I have a very like technical mind in mind, but I'm also excited when uh, I fail or something goes wrong. And you can really only uh, do that by literally doing it. So um, a lot of my collage work and abstraction, um, again, like I, I gather a lot of things, but then uh, I can only find out what happens through the actual process of putting things back together. So um, yeah, it's all connected. <laughs> and thank you. Great. Um, Karen. Um, has your you have your hand raised? Yes, I do. Um, it was it's so beautiful looking at your work, and I'm really drawn to how you can see so much of the process in the final objects. And I was kind of curious about like your significant the significance or your relationship with the idea that it seems to me that your work isn't so immediate. It's like these layers of, you know, whether it be the sun prints or the photography or the negatives, it's like there's there's all of these other things that then contribute to the final work. And I was just curious to hear anything more you could say about that. Oh yeah, um, some of my most favorite images or artwork is stuff that looks really simple, but if you start to peel back the layers, things get more complicated. Um, so I love objects that actually seem extremely simple, but are in fact very, very technical or very, very precise in certain ways that might not be so obvious. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm a huge fan of um, <laughs> subtle, complicated objects. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm happy that you can see that in parts of my work. Um, because yeah, I'm very drawn to a lot of artworks like that. I'm very drawn to like natural objects like that and yeah, artifacts of that nature. So uh, it's interesting to me. 
Thanks, Karen. And um, I just also want to point out Karen um, was an artist in residence uh, the first year that we did this program and piloted. So I'm always happy when our artists come back and participate in our community. Um, I will toggle back over to the Q&A and um, Anna Helgeson, who's our reader services librarian at BGC asks, um, can you talk a bit about the cyanotype process? Is a process you can do without access to a dark room? Yeah, actually, cyanotypes is one of the easiest photo processes that anyone can do at home. Um, it's non-toxic, which is awesome, so there's no silver in it at all. You literally can just buy cyanotype chemicals, and it's just two, two different parts that you mix together. Um, and you can just coat the uh, like paper in your bathroom and let it dry. And uh, you can do a lot of photograms with them. You don't necessarily have to print out negatives. Um, but the sun will develop these chemicals. So if you had nothing on it, it would just become that straight blue color. Um, and the cyanotype process is something that I think is really dear to a lot of photographers, including myself. Um, it was made by Anna Atkins a long time ago. Um, she was documenting plants uh, and she's also a very important like early female photographer. I don't know the date exactly, 18 something, probably late 1800s, because that's when a lot of photography stuff was happening. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's it, it's still a very accessible, um, again, seemingly simple technique, but there's so much variation that you can also get from this. Oh, and the drawings that I made is literally just Sharpie on acetate that I put on top of coated paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fascinating. Back to the um, panelist side, I see a hand from Zuko, who is a fellow at BGC um, this year. Uh, please um, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, Zuko, could you unmute? Yes, um, yes, it was me. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm a, a visiting fellow this year and um, I actually came from uh, Cooper Union. so. Very happy to see you graduate. And, um, yeah, and yeah. your talk was just so uh, rich in so many different levels. But one thing I like to point out is um, um, you must be aware that, you know, the usage of fragments, you know, the uh, actual uh, physical fragments of um, uh, the uh, the porcelain or um, uh, ceramics actually really have a sort of a metaphysical ontological significance uh, when you think about archaeological uh, the diggings. Um, I think it was brilliant that you brought out this the whole process of dissembling, fragmenting, and then um, and reconstructing a whole. I think it's exactly the way that I think archaeological ceramics um, um, studies um, have often um, taken place. Um, uh, you know, because a lot of things are not coming out intact. So I'm just wondering whether you ever really thought of at this level of sort of a conceptual. Uh, you know, ontological sort of um, level of um, fragmenting and reassembling uh, through archaeological means to bring up the history and think about the future. Um, do you have any thought of this now? Yes, definitely. And thank you so much for all of your kind words. Uh, that means a lot to me. Um, yes, there. I think there's something so um, like mysterious intriguing um like even if you find something when you're outside yourself um because when i was actually reading a lot about how people are finding a lot of porcelain fragments there's still so much archaeological work that is being done right now like in all parts of the world because of this trade like there's a ton of sites in like new mexico because there's a lot of chinese porcelain in all of the americas there was a lot of Mexican porcelain trading too. Um, and a lot of shipwrecks have actually provided like most of the like older object dating. Um, so these areas of like slippage and also um, places where discarded porcelain was put. So kind of just like these dumping grounds. Um, I think I was also reading about some in India as well. And uh, you know, it's like, you can just ask a local and you can go find a shard. Um, <laughs> this like, there, there's something so fascinating to me and so special about being so close but so far away from the past 
and especially having a lot of these objects like outlive a lot of people who like made these you know artists from the past um all of these objects are kind of being like passed down to artists of today and the future i think and i think it's really important to kind of like honor those things but then also um yeah like figure out how to move forward with them and what it means so yeah definitely i i feel like my <laughs> my ontological space and uh, the meaning of all these shards. Um, no, it's uh, very special to me. So um, it's, it's a work in progress still. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, on uh, the Q&A, um, next question is from A. Beidler. Apologies for any pronunciation errors. Question is, I wonder if you find a relationship between your careful placement of type, typesetting, and the placement of glass segments in your sculpt pieces. Mm -hmm. Great question, Anne. Hello. Um, we had taken a typesetting class together, actually, so this is very fun. Um, yeah, I guess I do. I, I am a bit obsessed with processes that uh, have to do with placement. <laughs> and uh, how those things are organized or disorganized for sure. So like uh, having like an establishment of a system, but then also being able to figure out what um, goes within or without those systems. Uh, yeah, no, for, for sure. Uh, type placing, placing glass. Um, some, sometimes things will print, sometimes th things will not. Sometimes the glass will break. <laughs> sometimes uh, it will stay in place. But no, definitely. Um, I, I definitely feel like I have my hand in a lot of different objects and placements and things of that nature. So cross media. We have another question from Mauricio Higuera. Huh? The research collection and visual association involved in your work have, as you pointed out, associations to cultural exchange, commerce, appropriation, and ultimately colonialism, which you commented on through Said's work. Can you speak to your re-engagement with the imagination within this context in relation to your own positionality as an artist? What do you imagine is the artist's position when caught in the middle of a colonial exchange? Great question. Great question. Um, I think a lot of artists right now are actually dealing with this question, um, especially as an American artists that come with a lot of baggage, uh, with a lot of cultural material that is imported, exported from colonial, from non-colonial places. Um, it's, it, it's literally everywhere. Um, it's, it's definitely something that has to be contended with. So um, again, with my like, with my feelings and like autobiographical relationship to a lot of these objects, I definitely just try to position myself where at least I know where I'm coming from. Um, with a lot of these objects from my childhood, that's like a whole nother like level of relation. Um, and you know, th that is separate from like a lot of the colonial, hi colonial histories of like how this bowl might have gotten to my grandparents like porcelain gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> and what it means for it to be like cheap or like not expensive and stuff and like how it got all the way over here. Um, I think it's important. I mean, part of the reason why I was extremely excited to actually uh, be able to research at BGC was because I had such a Western art history, um, like education in art school, because that's how it kind of still is. Um, and being able to actually educate myself <laughs> a bit more about what is happening with a lot of um, Eastern art history has been like already like game changing for me. Um, so just this process of like self education um, and uh, yeah, reflection is just how I've been trying to think about that and position myself. Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and our next question, um, uh, comment 
from Antonio Sanchez Gomez, who is a PhD student here at BGC and is dialing in from Bogota, um, says, thanks for this great talk. A little comment regarding to your interesting exercise of fragmentation, reconstruction, and rearrangement. You might be interested in checking out the impact of Chinese ceramics in Mexico through the Manila and trade and subsequent emergence of the Talavera pottery. And that, um, I guess, ties back to other <laughs> research directions you could be taking um, here in our library. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, I love any and all suggestions for things that I should be looking at. So um, I will definitely look at the Talavera pottery. Um, there was also this really beautiful um, uh, fountain in Mexico City that is actually made of a broken uh, Chinese export porcelain. It's called the Risco Fountain. It's like a sculpture in and of itself. It's really crazy. Um, so I am actually in interested in checking out um, a lot of the connection between Mexico and the Chinese export trade because it's very large. Um, no, but that's awesome. Thank you for that suggestion. Wonderful. Um, and another comment question from uh, Professor Meredith Lin, who teaches here. Thanks very much, Harley, for sharing some of your interesting and beautiful work with us. I would love to hear a little more about how archaeology inspires your work. Is the fragmentary nature of most archaeological artifacts significant, for example? Yes. <laughs> um, I almost feel like uh, having a finished artwork or a whole artwork is almost like a mythical thing in and of itself. Um, like there's something very honest about archeological fragments um, that I think also speak to a lot of the temporal conditions that a lot of these works live in. Um, I guess that's just something very true to me that um, really resonates with me on a visual level, on a intellectual level. And um, I don't know, as an artist, I almost feel like it's my responsibility to gather a lot of these visual things um, and just kind of uh, try to see what, I, what, what they can do now, you know? <laughs> so yes. Um, Oh, I, that question actually made me think a little bit about some of the work that you were showing and, and your process and sort of, um, because you're working in these and you're working in so many layers in terms of individual pieces, what, how do you determine when you're finished with something and moving on to, to something else, either as a piece or a series? Do you have a formula I for guess that? <laughs> the fun artist uh, answer to that is everything is still ongoing. <laughs> um, <laughs> So nothing is uh, technically a closed series yet, but um, uh, we'll see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some of them I have worked on more so than others. Um, the drywall series is more so of a closed series for sure. Um, that one was actually very technically difficult to produce. So that was more um, of a material constraint more than anything else. But um, besides the constraints of materials, uh, I'm still trying to make uh, shadow prints of slides and uh, collaging of that nature too. So ongoing. <laughs> ah, I see Karen Hinkle has a hand raised and I want to point out Karen was a longtime reader services librarian at BGC and is now at the University of Kentucky and has joined us today. So welcome Karen. And ask your question. Thank you. And thank you so much for your talk, Harley. I was really impressed with the depth of library research that you've done so far. And from all the comments in the Q&A today, you've got like a thousand directions you can go in. And that's kind of like <laughs> the fun part of library research. But I was wondering as a librarian and as somebody who's collecting library materials, were there aspects of your project that you were hoping to find information about that haven't been published in the library research yet? Are there things that you wanted to find but hadn't been able to come across? Oh, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> I would have to think about that for a little bit. Um, I still want to look up um, like older Chinese catalogs as well. Um, that just might be more of a technical uh, thing that I need to look up. Um, 
uh, like some, uh, uh, sorry, when I was re uh, researching the Bapo paintings, actually, I was only able to find one book on that, um, that was actually published really recently. So yeah, being able to, bibliography, 2018, that's really Yeah, cool. being able actually to find more resources on those um, types of uh, folk and kind of low commercial painting would be really great. Um, that kind of stuff is a little bit harder to find, just things that are um, <laughs> not as famous or uh, not as canon, I guess, but just call it a good challenge. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, some interesting um, research directions and suggestions coming in um, through the chat. Um, let's see, perusing Q&A. And is it, um, anybody else in our panelists have a question they'd like to ask. There are a couple, I see Heath and Yasuko's hands are still raised, but I think that's from your last question. And let, but um, feel free to ask again. Oh, I also see um, something in the chat about conservation. Um, this might be uh, worth noting or just something that might explain why I'm so fascinated with fragments, but I actually used to work in conservation. Um, I used to work in book conservation, and so <laughs> having worked with a lot of fragments of things and putting things back together, I do actually think that has influenced my art practice a lot. <laughs> so um, I do forget that is important to tell people <laughs> that I used to work in a profession to um, have kind of like seamless um, restoration, which is amazing and difficult. Um, and requires a lot of skill. Um, yeah, and I worked at the Frick Art Reference Library. Shout out to all my Frick, Frick friends. Yay. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, it, it was a really great time. And I actually learned a lot of technical um, stuff that I still use in my art practice today. And uh, yeah, no, that was a very formative uh, time in my life, actually. <laughs> yeah, and um, that I think that comment came from Professor Deborah Crone to, um, to point out that the Cultures of Conservation program is um, um, actively happening here and we do have um, material scientists and conservation um, in, in our um, orbit here and that's something that if you haven't looked at already, um, we can do together. I'm going to reach out to you guys then because I have not yet. <laughs> Great. So looking through. Any last questions for Harley? Um, now's the time. Um, oh, here's a question coming in. Um, what is, oh, is there a special significance to the color blue in Chinese art um, from I mean, I might not be like the great authority on uh, cobalt oxide per se, um, <laughs> I'm going to say short answer, yes. Um, I also think that the value of blue in the export porcelain trade is also something that's really complicated. Um, outside of the export porcelain context, I am not quite as, sh like, I, I'm not as sure. Um, it, it was really interesting because I was reading um, that uh, imperial wear didn't actually have blue and white designs until it started becoming export porcelain. Like it gained more value as it gained more value in foreign countries, um, which I also just thought was interesting in tandem. So um, I am still figuring it out, um, but no, great question. And Heath, do you have another question? I see. Um, it kind of is coming off that last question. Um, I like just from my courses here, um, the, the blue color actually has more of a grounding in um, Persia, which is interesting. And it, like you said early on, you said that the color blue being um, part of the exchange generally of objects and its origin in that is very, I hadn't 
weirdly hadn't really considered that fact, but I did know that um, that it did have it most the best blues, quote unquote, best blues do come from what is now Iran, just in, in Afghanistan in terms of trade. But I hadn't really considered it the way you mentioned it during the like at the beginning, where you said that that was an influence, and you showed a lot of examples that had kind of Persian influence in them early on. And I thought it kind of like just smacked me in the head when you said it because it was um it was like a level of exchange that's so early that I hadn't really coherently like acknowledged it. So I liked your approach with that, that the blue in itself is an exchange. And I have always found it really interesting, like as a as an educator, that our stereotype of Chinese porcelain is blue and white, but like you said, it doesn't actually start to come into popularity until this trade route happens. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so what we know as Chinese is ultimately made for Europeans in some ways. Yeah, and also like made for Persia too, um, yeah. because there was a huge demand, yeah, from Iran and Persia. Um, Basically, when we can travel again, I want to go to Turkey <laughs> to look at all these porcelains um, because like some of the biggest collections are all in the Middle East of these like incredibly like rare pieces. Um, <laughs> put that it on actually, your list. That reminded me of another question I meant to ask earlier. It was, um, you mentioned uh, a collection in, in, uh, in Istanbul and I didn't get the name of it written down and I couldn't know the spelling because you... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's Tokapi, T-O-P-K-A-P-I. <laughs> no, I've like never heard of that. And so good on you <laughs> for knowing that piece of information. <laughs> that is patient research <laughs> that I enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank it, you it, very it, much. Thank you. <laughs> There's a, another question that came up in the Q&A and actually it relates to a question that came up in the chat. So I'm going to ask them both. The Q&A question is um, from Mr. Oh, wonderful talk. Could you elaborate more on how you developed your photo sculptural practice? Was this conceptually driven, done through experiment, play? Um, and that uh, corresponds to um, a question that says, is there a particular work you might like to describe in depth about how these ideas function together? So if you do have something from the slideshow you wanted to talk about specifically, um, or just talk, that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so with my photo sculptural practice, um, I definitely start with a lot of concepts or what I think I'm going to do. Um, but when I actually start trying to adhere things, um, I guess you could say like I, I do a lot of different craft techniques of adhesion. <laughs> um, maybe you could cite my conservation background with that too. Um, play is a really big part of that and being able just to explore how things will attach or detach. Um, actually, like one of the things that I really love about conservation, um, like when, <laughs> when things aren't seamless, when I know obviously that is the goal, um, I, I, I still love it when it is still um, like you're able to understand how something was made. Um, actually, I, I feel like I talk about this with conservators a lot. Like if you go to museums and you see objects that look seamless with the right eye, you can see all of the cracks. Um, <laughs> and it's really fun actually to go to museums and point out to friends and be like, oh, look, they put that together there. And you can see because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and again, uh, to be able to peel back that layer on objects like this is something, uh, conceptually that I'm really interested in and uh, yeah just just playing around with it so it, it has been re really freeing in my practice just to have clear fragmentation <laughs> um, so it's been very fun thank you um, I do want to point out it's 1 15 and for some of us at BGC that means uh, it's time for class <laughs> to be mm -hmm. So if you need to leave um, the webinar at any time, um, you can do so. Um, but we 
uh, if we have more questions and more discussion, um, we are slated to go um, through 1.30. So I just wanted to give anyone an op opportunity to ask another question, uh, make a comment. Um, Heath, I see you have something, a uh, show and tell. <laughs> I have like a sub obsession with Chinese porcelain and repairs um, because I think it's so extreme in some cases how they're repaired um, because this is just like their nickel staples is what they used and I've researched it. And I don't know anybody that still does this, but I find it to be incredibly excessively beautiful. <laughs> um, <laughs> And like they, like even in the 18th century, they had the technology to drill through the glaze, but not drill all the way through. And they used a diamond drill, which is weird. Oh, wow. And then the staples are heated molten. And then when they cool, they pull the cracks together, pretty tightly sealed. Um, and I have a whole collection of Chinese 18th century porcelain plates because, but I bought specifically broken ones that were stapled and they did it to European ones too. And, um, but my favorite ones are the Chinese ones because they're so extreme in their repair. And I have a, um, like a small coffee cup that was an export wear piece and I'll go get it if you really want to see it. But the handle is ridiculous. And so the handle had broken off, they drilled all the way through and then basically tied it on with a steel ribbon. Oh, wow. um, and it's, it's, so it's not functional anymore because it's <laughs> not watertight. And I also have one that they filled a hole with like a steel, like, a, like a, an iron blob of molten metal and just like a squished in there. And again, not watertight anymore, but they still bothered to repair it. Um, and it's so, so extreme. And it's just has, it speaks something to like personal value to me. It's like the really obsessive, excessive over the top repairs are not done all the time to lengthen their life. Mm -hmm. um, there has to be something. And I feel like repairs sometimes um, tell a story because I feel like in my case, like I imagine like this was grandma's plate or something oh, yeah and there's something there's romance in that that I think an object in its entirety you can't read <laughs> no I agree and um the fascinating thing about the plate that you held up too is that there's like a front facing and then a back oh, yeah. facing and right. like I, I, hold actually... on. I have a ridiculous one I'll go grab it so can converse <laughs> no that's great we're gonna have to talk nickel staples sometime <laughs> yeah and I I want to um out something that Barb um, put in the chat is that we our object study collection um, that I don't know Harley if you've had much of a chance to interact with um, COVID has made that a little bit more complicated but there are a number of pieces um, with staple repairs and just a wide variety of different kinds of ceramics in that collection so um, if you haven't explored that yet you know the residency is only halfway through so there's time to yeah no barb i will reach out to you um because i would love to come look at some of that stuff in a safe way that sounds great see this cup there's this hole here that is filled with this like lead cylinder uh -huh. and then this is filled not with gold but like lead i'm sure it's poisonous to drink out of this but it doesn't hold water anyway so you're fine <laughs> um this is the mug i'm talking about like it has this like hold on let me like that is holding the handle on mm -hmm. and the inside <laughs> it like goes through and this this no it's not functional anymore and this one has 12 staples <laughs> in it and when i when i saw this i thought wow but that's also says something about about chinese hard paste porcelain too because mm -hmm. if it was bone china, it would have exploded when it exactly. broke. <laughs> and there's something about the strength and durability of it. And that's why we can still dig up solid pieces even because things like glass and things like, like bone china mm -hmm. are nowhere near the level of durability. <laughs> no, definitely. And like, I actually think a lot of these fragments or pieces uh, actually have a very photographic quality because they want 
to have one perspective to be perfect, if that makes sense. So yeah. it is exciting to me to be able to flip those whole things as objects because like photo sculptural things like <laughs> like I feel like that plate lives in the realm of photography too. <laughs> oh yeah well that's something about two dimension that mm -hmm. is a thing like a two-dimensional thing it allows for a front and a back. Mm -hmm. um, I and I did have a question how are you applying your photographs to the tile? Oh yeah so I'm actually doing digital um, should I share my screen just to go back to um, that piece? Okay, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, so um, to actually get these to stick on here, I am printing these on a plastic transfer film. It's called DOS film, and it's actually like an alcohol-based transfer system. Um, uh, you can buy this plastic film and uh, literally the ink and the plastic surface of one part of the film is transferred through an alcohol solution. So I actually transfer them when they're full pieces of tile. Um, and a, a lot of the tile I've actually been using, I've just found or has also been free. <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't been like a huge part of how I make this, it just keeps costs down, but uh, there's so much ceramic debris, uh, it's kind of crazy. Uh, same with glass, uh, New York City, you can just gather a lot of stuff. But um, with the photographs, I am printing um, my own photographs on like an Epson uh, large format inkjet printer. Um, you can also do them on smaller printers and then breaking them. So if we go back here, actually, you can see like whole pictures and uh, literally just breaking them with a hammer, sanding down the sides because they have to be smooth to actually put the copper on. And uh, then you cover all the edges in copper. It's like making a little present, you wrap them up. And then um, you can either put them back in the same order, you can kind of mix up all the orders of stuff. So this is actually where like a lot of the play comes in because um, I basically feel like I'm making a lot of puzzle pieces and then I'm just kind of rearranging them. Um, and uh, let's see, the same way with all these drawings actually, I'm just doing graphite transfers and then fixing it with resin. Um, I, I probably should actually take a ceramics class at this point. <laughs> um, that's also on the to-do list. Um, but this is also just kind of a fast and fun way to draw something, break them, um, kind of foil them, and then rearrange and kind of put them back together this way. So yeah, just... Uh, I will add, don't jump too hard to take a ceramics class because yeah. I think the romance of your application, uh -huh. you'd be sad at the loss of it <laughs> because sure. like modern transfer, mm -hmm. it's so it's so digitally like it's it takes the artist's hand out of it a lot. So don't mm -hmm. jump for that. Um, <laughs> it's not and it's not like you're planning to eat off of these. Um, right. <laughs> so it's like but so don't be too eager. And also like transferring from engraving like they did in the 19th century is oh, yeah. incredibly, incredibly difficult. And actually, unless you have the right tissue, mm -hmm. it's like not, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> like it's just not going to, because it's just, it doesn't always work right with typical engraving inks. Um, so don't jump to that too fast <laughs> or you'll be sad because you won't have the play anymore. And I think the play is, I get it. I get that. There is something fun about doing something in a, a slightly ridiculous roundabout manner. Um. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course it is. <laughs> I was gonna say, Harley, you can either do some um, deep dives into the BGC study collection or just go to Heath's apartment mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, look at his stuff because he's <laughs> got his own object that he collected. I'll have to get to you. But you're welcome to, and Samuel <laughs> probably would be good to like, let somebody else be in here with it for a little while. <laughs> in safer time. Um, so we are, we're getting to uh, the point where we need to close um, for the afternoon. Um, and uh, 
uh, you can get in touch um, with me for more conversation uh, with Harley uh, if you wanted to take this um, further. Um, but I want to thank Harley so much for, for sharing her work and participating in this um, project uh, today. And I also want to give a big shout out to Laura Mickey, who um, our Associate Director of the Research Institute for helping make um, this public Zoom webinar uh, possible and to John Carmo for his excellent IT support. It's always complex to make these things happen. Um, I also want to thank Emily Riley and Nadia Rivers from our Public Programs Department that helped bring this entire residency to fruition. And um, the library staff here at BGC who has been so enthusiastic um, collaborating with our, our artists and all of you for coming today and participating in this conversation.